We're in lesson number 42, and uh, David has run from Saul. Saul has tried to pin him against the wall with a spear again for the second time. And David has run home to his wife, Michal. Saul suspected that David would go home to his wife, <clears throat> and that he did. And when David's wife heard the news of what Saul had done, she was concerned. So the writer tells us how Michal let David down through a window as a plan to keep him safe. Chapter 19, verse number 11 is where we are. Chapter 19 and verse number 11. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But Michal, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. So Michal let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and escaped. Michal took the household idol and laid it on the bed and put a quilt of goat's hair at its head, covered it with cloth. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. Then Saul sent messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me on his bed, that I may put him to death. When messengers entered, behold, the household idol was on the bed with the quilt goat's hair at its head. So Saul said to Michal, Why have you deceived me like this and let my enemy go so that he has escaped? And Michal said to Saul, He said to me, Let me go. Why should I put you to death? David escaped from Saul that night and went home to his wife. And from the context of Saul's command, he evidently did not want David killed in the house, a house on Saul's family property that probably, absolutely, Saul owned. The instruction was to wait until morning with the intent of killing David as he left the house. Michal knew her father. She wanted David out and safe that night, in the dark of the night. We must wonder why she let David down through a window. Did she see her father's men waiting in the front of the house? Probably so. Therefore, David was let down from a window. Now this fact tells us something about where David, the David was not living in a tent. He was living in a wood and brick structure of some sort, of some sort of home. Tents did not have windows high enough that you had to let people down out of them. Solid structures did. So it may have been a home built by the Canaanites and taken over by the Israelites when the promised land was taken. Because you must remember, the Lord promised Israel that they would live in homes they did not build. So we also know that Saul's hometown was a walled city. <clears throat> They're in Gibeah in a walled city. And it had a, a wall around it to protect it. Now we know this because the civil war between the 11 tribes of Israel and the tribe of Benjamin occurred at Gibeah, this same town, back in Judges chapter 22, many years before. And out, um, David went, went out the window, through the window, and Michal had a plan. Now during the time when David left the house, she would prepare for her interaction with her father's men in the morning. She knew her father. She knew what was going on. So let us set the timing found in this verse. The writer tells us that Michal took the household idol and used it in the bed as a decoy. Why did Michal have a household idol in her house? Was it hers? Was it David's? Did David know about it? The Lord forbid idols. Would the Lord allow David to be king in the future if he was worshiping idols in his home or his wife was worshiping idols? Hmm. The purpose of an idol in a home is false worship of a God besides the true God. I think not. What is going on here? Well, it is at this point in the scripture that I paused, and I want to tell you, I took a week to read all the scholars, everything all the scholars of the past 
had written about this passage. All of them have taken the same position. But I must tell you, I am going to disagree with their conclusion and let me explain. In the Ten Commandments, the Lord said this, You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. You shall not make for yourself an idol or any likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. The Hebrew word for idol is the word pesel, P-E-S-E-L. And it means a graven or carved image of wood, stone, metal, clay, something else. Concerning these idols, pestles, P-E-S-E-L, they were not to be worshipped as stated in the last sentence of the passage. The context is therefore it was a sin to carve an image out of wood, stone, metal, whatever, for the purpose of worship. What kind of thing could not be carved according to the Lord? He told us. He said, any likeness of what is in heaven above or on the earth beneath or in the water under the earth. Such carvings would forbid cherubim, brazen serpents, ox, birds, fish, clouds, trees, stars, planets, wheels, carts, mountains, rivers, valleys, etc. Whatever you want it is. All those would be forbidden to be, to be uh, carved. So when we see it in this light, absolutely no artist could create a piece of artwork of any kind because it might resemble something God created in heaven or on earth. Artists have no work then. The Lord does not mean that in His words. In this commandment, the Lord is prohibiting the creation of any carved idol, a pestle, for the purpose of worship. He is not forbidding the artist's work, but rather the human use of that work in worship. However, our writer does not use the word pestle here in relation to this term of this idol with Michal, he that is used to create this fake David in the bed. He used the word teraphim. Now, the first time we saw the word teraphim used in the scripture was in Genesis 31. Well, Rachel stole her father's teraphim when Jacob moved the family from Haran back to Isaac's home in southern Canaan land. As it was not yet the possession of the nation of Israel, which will develop from the sons of Jacob. It was, he was returning at the time, but listen, this is not promised land yet. Some of our English translations use the word teraphim instead, and I wish they did here too in, this, in our text. Some of our translations use the word household idols, just as our text does, and I'm very disappointed in it. A teraphim is not a pestle. A teraphim is the Hebrew word for a work of art. It is not an idol. Follow me here. The teraphim is a carving of wood, stone, metal, clay, or some other material that is used for decoration, not for worship. In Genesis 31, the items Rachel took for her from her father's home were pretty objects for decoration that she liked. To Laban, Laban, her father, he used them as, as his gods. But even in Genesis 31, the carvings are not called pestles as gods. They are, it is clear that Laban used the carvings as his pestles, his idols, while at the same time, Rachel thought of them as pretty things to decorate with, teraphim, simply pretty, pretty things to decorate in her house, and she wanted them. We saw the word teraphim used next in Judges chapter 17 to 18, and there 
Micah's personal household items, he had a robe called an ephod, it's just a robe, idols called pestles, and teraphim, pretty household decorative items. We are not told in Judges that Michael worshipped the teraphim, but he most definitely worshipped the pestles, the idols. Now, the third time we see the word teraphim is right here in this passage. In David and Michael's home being used as a substitute for David's body under the covering of a blanket. May we connect and correct another problem with the translator's use of the word household idol. Instead of the decorative term teraphim, by calling this a household item, the mere term lends itself to think that this object had a head that needed to be covered with goat's skin, to be furry or hairy. But a literal translation of the Hebrew tells us something different. The literal translation of the Hebrew rendered in the English would say it like this. Mikhail took an image and laid it in the bed and a cover of goat's hair put for his head and covered with cloths. Get that? Mikhail took an image and laid it in the bed and a cover of goat's hair put for his head and covered with cloth. The teraphim Michael used to form the body in the bed did not have a head. Therefore, she used a goat's hide to create a head and cover with the cloth. The teraphim was not a household idol. It was a pretty object that David and Michael had in their home. Look around at your home and see how many teraphim you have. Do you have a picture of your family on the wall? Those are images, printed images, teraphim. Do you have pretty vases? Do you have candlestick holders? Do you have tables? Do you have chairs? Do you have of wood, of clay, of stone? Do you have metal things, etc.? They are all teraphim. And unless you use them as a pestle, an idol, and bow down to them to worship, there's nothing wrong with them. Any teraphim can become an idol and be worshipped. By the way, anything we have can become an idol and worshipped. But in this case, David and Michal did not worship the decorative item Michal used to imitate David in the bed. It was just a pretty object in the house. And the trick worked. When the messengers of Saul saw that David was not coming out the front door, they must have knocked. Michal told them David was sick in the bed. They looked. She saw the king's daughter. She was the king's daughter. Who were they to question that he was sick on the bed, question her words? So they returned to give the report to Saul, what they had learned. Saul did not care and ordered them to go back and bring him on his sick bed to Saul so Saul could kill him. When they found the fake David instead, they delivered Michal to Saul. When questioned by Saul why she helped David, Michal lied. She said it was David's ideal to protect her. It was not. It was Michal's ideal to protect David. She did not want her father to know her true love for David was still there. She really did love David. But when the rest of the story continues in 2 Samuel, we will see that her love has went, will wane as the years pass. Now, when David climbed out the window and ran in the night, where did he go? Well, he went to Samuel. Samuel protects David, chapter 19, verse 18. Now David fled and escaped and came to Samuel at Ramah and told him all that Saul had done to him. And he and Samuel went and stayed at Naanoth. It was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Okay, word travels fast. Saul quickly learned that David and Samuel were in Naanoth in Ramah. Where is Naanoth in Ramah? It is evident that Naanoth was somewhere in or about Ramah. The word Naanoth means habitation, huts, or dwellings. Forget this. Not just by itself, habitation, huts, or dwellings of a school. A school that Samuel presided over, as Elisha would also do later in Gilgal near Jericho. The school was within the boundaries of the village of Ramah. Samuel presided over this prophetic school at Naoth, as we will see in the text. 
And the writer tells us of Saul's first messengers being changed. Verse number 20. Then Saul sent messengers to take David. But when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying with Samuel standing and presiding over them, the Spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. Now there are two kinds of prophecy in the Old and New Testament. The first is predicative prophecy. Predicative prophecy is the kind that we all think of when we hear the word prophecy. We think about a person predicting and telling the future. The second kind of prophecy is admonition prophecy. And it can be either accusative or it can be exhortive. And admonition is an old word, so a modern word simply means it is a speech. That's all it is. Today we would call it a sermon. So in these sermons with Samuel at the school in the earshot of the messengers of Saul, the messengers heard the preaching, the preaching of sermons from the scripture that was already recorded with all its blessings and warnings. These men would stand out and begin just to preach all of them at the same time something out of the scripture. If they preached blessings, they were called exhortive sermons. If they preached warnings, they were accusative sermons. So in the case of Samuel, these prophets were not telling the future. They were simply repeating what was already in the scripture. Now, the verse also says about these prophets that Samuel was standing and presiding over them. The literal Hebrew says Samuel was the standing leader over them. It does not indicate that Samuel was there at the time standing where he could be seen. Samuel and David probably were safe in one of the huts and this, this point would become important soon. Samuel may have been on this first crew coming through where the, the men saw Samuel, but he's not going to be there. But he is the presiding head over this school. So when the first messengers failed to retrieve David, the writer tells us of Saul's second messengers who were also changed. Verse 21. And it was told Saul he sent other messengers and they also prophesied. The result of the second team was the same as the first team. So Saul's third messengers also changed. Verse 21b. So Saul sent messengers again a third time and they also prophesied. With three teams changed in the presence of of Samuel's school, Saul went to see it for himself, and the writer tells us how Saul was changed. Then he himself went to Ramah and came as far as the large well that is at Siku, and he asked and said, Where are Samuel and David? And someone said, Behold, they are at Naoth in Ramah. He proceeded there to Naoth in Ramah, and the Spirit of God came upon him also, so that he went along prophesying, continuing until he came to Naoth in Ramah. He also stripped off his clothes, and he too prophesied uh, before Samuel and laid down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore, they say, is Saul among the prophets. Okay. As we know, all we know about Siku is that it is somewhere on the way from Gibeah to Ramah. That's all we know. Be that as it may, as Saul departed from Sechar, the Spirit of God came upon him, and he began to prophesy a sermon from the Scripture all the way to the prophetic school called Naanoth in Ramah. This was the second time the Lord had sent the Spirit of God upon Saul. The first time was on the day Saul was anointed. Uh, Samuel anointed him as king, as a new king, and, and that time he prophesied on the holy hill outside of Gibeah, his own town. This time he prophesied from Siku to Ramah on his way. Saul, when Saul arrives at Ramah, after prophesying, he took off his clothes and he slept all day and all night. Now we must look at three interpretive problems in this verse, verse number 24. First, when the writer says he also stripped off his clothes before he prophesies, it means he took off his outer garments, which would have been his kingly robe, his belt, and his cape. Now, second, when the writer tells us that he too prophesied before Samuel, it means that Saul joined the other young prophets who studied under Samuel as they prophesied that day. 
but we have a problem with this language. Was Saul in the presence of Samuel or was he not? Even if Samuel was standing at a distance and Saul was with the other prophets, which he was, it would mean that we have a conflict in Scripture. When Samuel left Saul after killing Agag, the writer tells us Samuel went to Ramah, but Saul went up to his house at Gibeah of Saul. Samuel did not see Saul until the day of his death, for Samuel grieved over Saul. So we got a conflict here. Here is what, where we must address the question we ask before in verse 20. Did Samuel see Saul prophesying or did he not? In verse 20, was Samuel standing and presiding over the prophecy that was going on in Naanoth when Saul arrived? Or, as the literal translation says, Samuel was the standing leader of the school and was not, stand, and was not standing there to see Saul and Saul did not see him. Okay, third, the writer tells us that Saul lay down naked all day and all night. Well, let me answer that other question. The answer is Saul, Samuel was the standing presiding officer and he was not there of the school. That's the way I understand it from the original. So here the question is, it says Saul laid down naked all day and all that night. Okay, here we must confess. Saul was naked, but not as we would consider naked. When we consider naked, we think of being completely nude, but that, but not, that was not what would be considered that in David's day and in Saul's day. In Saul and David's day, that would not be the case. The men wore this outer robe with their belts and all that mentioned, and Saul took that off and began to prophesy. These robes were important to the outer look, and the men tried to keep them clean. One of the garments was a long piece of material um, of the outer robe. It was a long piece of material that the men would use like a sheet or like something to cover up to keep the bugs off of them at night. All right. But the inner gu garment, okay, covered everything, and that is what Saul had on when he was prophesying. It went all the way down. It's an inner garment. It went down to probably uh, knee leaf or whatever. Okay. But... In order to keep the smell of body odor away and all that kind of stuff too, uh, when it came time to sleep, Saul pulled off that inner garment off and what he was left was wearing what is called an undergarment which covered the upper torso but did not go below his waist. So as such, naked was, Saul was naked from his waist down. But he probably used the special material that we spoke about as a sheet and to protect him from the insects and all that. But all this was said by the writer because Saul arrived at Naanoth and David had departed. More than likely, Samuel accompanied David for a distance while the prophesying was going on at the school. So Saul is naked from his waist down all night, all that kind of stuff. No Samuel, no David. We come to an unfortunate chapter break at this point in the scripture. It's unfortunate. This story continues into the next chapter with David running from Naanoth to find Jonathan, Saul's son. So more, get, get this, more of David's music is going to be recorded right here at this time. I want to end this lesson with reading one of his psalms that he's writing, that David is writing and, and playing as he departs and talks about this time. It says, for the choir director, a psalm of David to be accompanied by stringed instruments. Answer me when I call to you, O God who declares me innocent. Free me from my troubles. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you, you people ruin my reputation? How long will you make groundless accusations? How long will you continue your lies? You can be sure of this. The Lord set apart the godly for himself. The Lord will answer when I call to him. Don't sin by letting anger control you. Think about it overnight and remain silent. Offer sacrifices in the right spirit and trust the Lord. Many people say, who will show us better times? Let your face smile on us, Lord. 
you have given me greater joy than those who have abundant harvest of grain and new wine. In peace I will lie down and sleep, for you alone, O Lord, will keep me safe. That's Psalm number 4. David also writes at this time Psalm number 5. He says, For the choir director, a psalm of David to be accompanied by the flute. O Lord, hear me as I pray. Pay attention to my groanings. Listen to my cry for help. My King and my, my God, for I pray to no one but you. Listen to my voice in the morning, Lord. Each morning I bring my respect to you and wait expectantly. O God, you take no pleasure in wickedness. You cannot tolerate the sins of the wicked. Therefore, the proud may not stand in your presence, for you hate all who do evil. You will destroy those who tell lies. The Lord detests murderers and deceivers. Because of your unfailing love, I can enter your house. I will worship at your temple with deepest awe. Lead me in the right path, or my enemies will conquer me. Make your way plain for me to follow. My enemies cannot speak a truthful word. Their deepest desire is to destroy others. Their talk is foul, like the stench from an open grave. Their tongues are filled with flattery. O oh God, declare them guilty. Let them be caught in their own traps. Drive them away because of their many sins for they have rebelled against you but let all who take refuge in you rejoice let them sing joyfully praises forever spread your protection over them that all who love your name may be filled with joy for you bless the godly O Lord you surround them with your shield of love Psalm number five